Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Gabriel Martin, your host for this evening. If you're joining our program for the first time, Open Your Eyes to the Universe is a series of contemporary talks, conversations, open-eyed meditations and interviews with people who inspire and uplift others just by sharing their wisdom, their insights and experiences to co-create a better world. As we begin, the Universe team would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. We pay our respects to the elders of the past, the present, and those emerging, and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. We also acknowledge and respect the wise elder within us all, and the collective wisdom of all those here this evening. So last month on Universe, we were talking with Dr. Tamsin Ramsey, discussing her in the field research on sustainable yogic farming. Now that's an agricultural practice which demonstrates the invisible yet tangible link between our thoughts and their impact on matter, more specifically in this instance, food crops. Using Raj Yoga meditation as taught by the Brahma Kumaris, this ancient meditation technique was deployed for enhancing crop performance in farming, with an added benefit of improving social well-being of the farmers. And you can check that episode out if you happen to miss it, and Debbie will place the link in the chat box. And so here we are tonight, and we're in the company of Morni Chen, an author and yogini, and Dr. Melinda Lewis, who works in Australian higher education as an academic. And our topic this evening is authenticity. So what does it mean to be authentic? And what happens when we're not being authentic? If someone were to ask you, are you an authentic person? Would you find this an easy question to respond to? Perhaps we all try to be ourselves, yet find this compromised as we put on a persona to please others or to fit in or to be liked. Yet true authenticity is rare, but it's something that is highly valued in friendships, relationships and careers. There's a lot of definitions of authenticity, but here's something that I like. The Latin root of the word authenticity is author. So being authentic doesn't mean just being honest about who you are. It's about being your own author. And in this sense, authenticity is an active and creative process. I'm going to refer now to Brene Brown in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection. She says this about authenticity. Authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. It's not something we have or don't have. It's a practice, a conscious choice of how we want to live. Authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to let our true selves be seen. And so tonight on Open Your Eyes to the Universe, we're exploring what it means to be an authentic person, how to maintain our authenticity and what happens to us when we're not being authentic. Melinda and Moni, it's lovely to have you with us tonight as we explore authenticity. A very, very warm welcome to both of you. Be great to see you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Lovely to be here. Yeah, and good to see you. Moni, Moni a warm welcome. And, and also, Melinda, lovely to have you with us. Look, viewers, I'd like to introduce Moni to you first as she's our first speaker. So Moni is currently the coordinator of the Yarra Valley Living Centre in Victoria. She's traveled, read, and learned widely. And Moni has taught and studied Raj Yoga meditation for over 40 years, establishing and sustaining meditation centers in Australia, Hong Kong, Cambodia, and the Philippines. In Hong Kong, Moni was the moderator of the Hong Kong Network on Religion and Peace. She was the chairperson of Unity and Peace, the secretary of Living Values Education, and secretary of the Asian Business Leadership Exchange. She also helped to establish the Food Link Foundation, an NGO linking hotels and restaurants with social welfare organizations. And Moni went on to establish social enterprises for victims of landmines, the Khmer Independent Life Team, and the Peace Cafe, a vegetarian community cafe offering values and environmental training in Cambodia. And then from 2010 to 2014, she organized something like 50 dialogues throughout India for the Future of Power Project, 
which was bringing leaders together to explore the use and I guess the misuse of power. Mooney is also an author, and she's written a book called Mystic at the Edge, A Western Woman Colored by Asia. It's a spiritual travelogue, which is entertaining, but also it's very deep and reflective. The first part of her book spans Mooney's life growing up in white Australia, marrying her Chinese husband, Tom, traveling through Asia in search of a monastery where they could pursue the teachings of Buddha, on to Europe and back to Australia, where they began to to follow the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris. And in parts two and three of her book, Mourney shares deep explorations and contemplations on practical spirituality and her spiritual philosophy and lifestyle and how it interfaces with wider worldviews. Mystic at the Edge shows that spirituality is a natural calling in all of us to practice being who we really are and support each other in making a better world. Her spiritual journey is outlined in Mystic at the Edge as a journey of authenticity. And so, Mourney, we'd love to hear from you about your spiritual journey in the context of authenticity. Thank you very much, Gabriel. It's really wonderful to be here. And I think you've led us very beautifully into this topic. And I'm sure whoever's tuning in, it's a topic very close to people's heart and for me, I think it's been my, my journey. I really, I don't know how close I am to being fully authentic, but it's certainly been top of my list in terms of my development, if you like, because, you know, at the end of the day, I have to be me. I mean, at the end of the day, I am me. I can follow other people. I can listen to others and I can adopt whatever practice I want but at the end of the day it's me facing me being me and so authenticity yes is um really to as you said Gabriel um to author your own life and I think this is the the journey to really author my own life because uh I think a lot of people a little bit hesitant to be involved in an organization and I was too but I think we can navigate an being within an organization and still living true to our principles it's the same in the outside world you know people go into politics not always easy to completely keep with your values and yet it's possible and needs to be done so I would say that authenticity is really thinking, saying, feeling, and doing the same thing, that all these are in alignment and doing that consistently. And this is when I can trust myself and others can trust me when I'm really the same inside and out and aligned. And I very much like a quote by Alan Cohen that I think summarizes it. They say a picture paints a thousand words. And in the book, Mystic at the Edge, I start every segment with a quote because I think a quote also says a thousand words. And Alan Cohen says, everything will line up perfectly when knowing and living the truth becomes more important than looking good. And I think this is one of the things that gets in the way of our authenticity, what we call the looking good syndrome. And we can even have this in a meditation center, you know, the way we sit and how we appear to others. It can also be something that kind of gets us off track because if we're trying to look good, we're not always being true to who we really are. And another wonderful quote is from Don Matteo Sol, to become authentic, we require a thirst for freedom. And this is key to what authenticity is and key to what personally I aspire for, to be completely free free of influences, 
free of all the other voices that might come in my head. And that's very important to be able to hear my own conscience because we all know, I think deep down, we all know what is right, what is real, what is me. And yet, it's not always easy to hear that inner voice because there's so many voices in our head of our teachers, our parents, our religious leaders. There's so many voices telling me what I should be, how I should behave. And we really need to go beneath all of those. We need to be able to listen to our own voice. And, you know, our conscience dictates our life, whether we like it or not. Our conscience dictates our life to us. If we try to suppress or kill our conscience, it will come back even stronger in some way, whether it's in illness or whether it's in relationships. So we really do need to be true to our conscience. And it's a most wonderful aspect of the soul, this whole idea of conscience that really is a guide. But of course, it takes a lot of courage to be ourselves. Most people are influenced by beliefs and perceptions and thoughts given by others. But genuinely authentic individuals are not those who follow. They're ones who think for themselves, think and see that alignment with the inner truth. Because I think this is what authenticity is about. It's about living my inner truth to the best of my ability, as close to it as I can. And as Socrates says, to find yourself, think for yourself. So if we're followers, we can't be ourselves. We can't know who we really are, which I think is the practice of meditation and, you know, living an authentic life. And every decision we make on the basis of authenticity is what defines our life. It's who we are. So all the time we are having to make choices and decisions and we get the chance all throughout the day to choose what we're going to do at that moment. And Daddy Janki, the former head of the Brahma Kumaris, I remember her giving in response to this question, what is spirituality? And Daddy simply said, it's to ask yourself at every moment, what am I meant to be doing now? So that means we have that choice at every moment. And, you know, I've had a real aversion, I would say, to clicks. And I was, I didn't continue with university because I just didn't like the clicks that surrounded me. And I didn't want to be in one because it, it, separates us from others. And when I came into the Brahma Kumaris, I was one of the first um, non-Indians, pe people outside of India, to become a student. And I was part of a little group of people that as, you know, more and more um, centers spread over the world, I was part of this little group. But I didn't like it because it seemed to define me. People would look at me in a certain way and not see me. And I would could also get trapped in that, you know, projecting myself in a certain way that wasn't me. You know, it, it's all a play on power. And, you know, Gabriel mentioned that I lived in India for four years and I was traveling to 50 cities throughout India to invite people into dialogues all over India to talk about the future of power, which was really emphasizing soft power. 
So soft power is values and spirituality and qualities and not guns and money and, you know, what, what we now see as power. But authentic power is really about being able to influence and not be influenced. It's this whole thing of I can. And so it does take an inner thing to have that self-confidence. So I think it's good to ask the self. I know a lot of people shun this word power because it's been so corrupted, but you can't avoid it. It's in every relationship. When we're with others, there's a little power play all the time. So we can't avoid it. So we are best to embrace it and educate ourselves on that whole aspect of power. So it's, you know, it's to acknowledge also that every being is a powerful entity and power has its base in our consciousness because for a while I was practicing gentleness and I thought, oh, I also need to balance this with power. What does it mean to be powerful? And I realized it's all about the consciousness I have. That's what power is. It's not about what I do. It's not about what I say or the position I hold. It's the consciousness. And powerful people are those whose thoughts and actions are informed and shaped by an inner level of awareness rather than learned and inherited beliefs and perceptions. But that inner awareness is what needs to inform everything in my life. Everyone does have this deep sense of truth. And together with this conscience, we are also, as we get in touch with that, able to develop our intuition. And intuition is not intellect. It's not analyzing. Intuition is that deep knowing. And it comes from inside at a level that it's not even often conscious. It's very, it comes from the subconscious, the intuition. And if I'm able to activate and purify, cleanse my conscience and my intuition, then I can move forward in my journey, I find, in a very clear and powerful way. Sometimes when I do things, I don't even know why I do them, but I've learned to trust my intuition and it has served me. So more and more, I have got to trust it. And thinking and acting from personal realizations based on my own truth is what brings that authenticity, not compromising, suppressing, or avoiding our truth. Because sometimes it's more convenient, we feel, to do that. But as I said, the conscience will, will take its toll on us. So I, as much as possible, want to live that truth. And if we're able to be in touch with that intuition, it saves a lot of waste, thought and energy, because that deeper knowing is much more essenceful than a whole analytical reasoning. And, you know, in the world today, I think it's very hard to know what to trust, what to believe. So it's so important to be in touch with those inequalities. And many of us, you know, really muddle through life and, you know, we, we just keep trying to see what works as we follow others and try to conform. But when we look at, you know, people who've really had a lot of power and influence in the world, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, you know, by recognizing their greatness, then we can see what authenticity is and the power it has to influence others in a positive way and what it is to be unaffected by others, not to sell our soul in any way. 
Um, and that's something that we have to be mindful of because I think, you know, we can be bought sometimes too cheaply. Then uh, another quote I'd like to share from, again, Brené Brown, as Gabriel was mentioning, if you trade your authenticity for safety, you may experience anxiety, depression, eating disorders, addiction, rage, blame, resentment, and inexplicable grief. And I find this very interesting because safety is one of our most basic needs. And yet, if we, you know, if we trade our safety for our authenticity, we're going to become undone. So what is safety? That's what we have to ask. When I lose myself, I lose my sense of true north, which is where my values will take me. And if I lose the sense of that truth and that direction, I can end up anywhere. And then I use a lot of time and energy to try and find myself back on my line. So we really need to discern, you know, what is valuable in our life. And also how to use and direct our energy. We need to know when to express and how to use our energy to achieve what we want to achieve in the world. But equally, we need to know when to withdraw and go inward to conserve our energy, to replenish and um, restock and take account of what's going on so we can revitalize ourselves. And this is in particular where meditation can be so helpful to know how to go within and access the inner self. And then a quote from Oprah Winfrey, because I think relationships are a very important aspect also in authenticity. Don't settle for a relationship that won't let you be yourself. I've um, been quite interested, and it probably is my second passion, nonviolent communication taught by Marshall Rosenberg. And why is because it fosters compassionate relating and independence, interdependence, where we can work together to meet each other's needs and to be authentic in a relationship is to be honest and yet sometimes when we're honest it can be confusing it can be um, sometimes even feel hurtful or as we're self-actualizing we can step on others so this whole learning of non-violent communication is something I'm practicing so that I can really see the other person's needs as well as my own, that when I'm expressing myself, I'm keeping in mind the other person. It's about getting what I want, for reason, but for reasons that are important and yet not taking that in a way that I will regret later my behavior. So these are just some of my thoughts that I'd like to start with in this beautiful sharing on something so important as authenticity. Thanks, Moni. That was, um, I, I love the way that you were outlining things so clearly around authenticity and sharing, you know, your own little journey with us as well at different points. Um, one of the things I was really noting was the courage that it takes to be authentic. Um, it, it, because, you know, you're talking about it as being something that um, is something that you're doing every step of the way. And you quoted Daddy Janky in that. But um, in that alignment with your inner truth, that that's really what's what's at heart here and um I was appreciating too your comments around saying that you know right at the outset that it's a journey that that you're working you continue to work towards it and and why it's so front and center for you because actually 
each of us are with ourselves 24 7 always and um and, and and therefore the need to really stay very authentic um i was intrigued about the relationship and didn't quite get it the relationship between authenticity and intuition that you outlined i wondered if you could just say a little bit more about that yeah i think these two things conscience and intuition are within what we would say within the soul within i the soul and we are not generally very in touch with these very essential elements that can guide our life. So the conscience, you know, we talked about, but also this intuition. When I, I find when I can really walk my truth and be um, aligned with my destiny and almost because there is a certain destiny for each of us. And when I can walk the path that I feel is aligned with that destiny, then this, um, you know, this intuition emerges. And to give you an example of that, when I was working in India with the project, The Future of Power, I gave one year's notice after three years, I'd covered the 36 cities I signed up for. And it was still continuing. And I gave, gave one year's notice for no reason. I didn't have, I was enjoying it. It was fulfilling. I was loving it, actually. Mm. And the relationships were great. But I had an intuition that said, one more year and then leave this. So mm. I, I told the coordinator of the project that I'll leave in one year. And I didn't really know why, you know. But if mm. my inner voice says that, I just act on that. And then I came back to Australia and I thought, I want to do Bowen therapy. I'd never done it before. Didn't really know what it was. And it all just worked out. The person I was working with, she was going to a Bowen therapist and I got a treatment. I don't even know what it was for, what was wrong with me. But I find that I generally maintain very good health. And I feel it's because I follow this intuitive path. So I try to seek treatment before I get sick. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. and Brene Brown's outlined the consequence of of being inauthentic or one of the consequences is you know a list of things and I mean I'm sure most people would relate to it anxieties depressions and the list was quite a long one um, unidentified rage and and uh, and so on so yeah that ability to stay authentic Melinda some comment from you we've uh, you have a different background and we're going to um uh, you know, hear more from you later. But any response from you to some of the things that Morni's been saying in this first part? Yes, thank you, Gabrielle, and thank you, Morni. Very deep concepts and deep notions. And I think what I'm really appreciating is how you've connected them. You're really connecting them under this broader umbrella of authenticity. And they're all really valued and important. So you're not privileging one of these concepts like courage or intu intuition over the other. They're all really important and they're all there together. And I think speaking of them all together and how they're connected is a really powerful way to think about being really authentic and that we're on a journey of authenticity, I think, very much a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice indeed. Thank you. Um, Moni, can we go on a meditative journey with you into authenticity? Would you be happy to, to share a, a live meditation commentary with us on that? Into it. Yeah. So, first of all, just hold this word authenticity in the mind as we think, so we feel. So, feel what this quality informs in you. And then think over the various aspects of power, truth, courage, And where you sit with these, 
power, truth, courage. Sometimes when we hear these words, we feel, oh yes. And sometimes we feel, oh, I'd forgotten that for a while. Let me go back to giving that particular quality some more attention in my life to fine tune. And these leading to these subtle aspects of conscience and intuition. We often talk about awakening the conscience. When I think about these qualities, I recognize that they are within myself. They're not something I need to find outside, but qualities that simply need to be awakened, experienced, because they all lead to more coherent and peaceful life. Peace is the basis for all of these qualities. It's like the ground where everything can develop. It's the soil beneath all the qualities. So always bring the self back to peace. Peace. Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you, Moni. Yeah, that was um, a very lovely meditation and connecting some of those key aspects of authenticity together into that very succinct and powerful meditation. Thank you for that, indeed. We're going to... Um, we're going to be having questions and answers later on in this session, and I know there's a few coming in, so I'm going to push pause on that at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and give everyone the opportunity to, to get to know our second speaker. So um, I'd like to turn your attention to Dr. Melinda Lewis now as I introduce her. <clears throat> excuse me. So Melinda's been working in Australian higher education as an academic, and she explores the interweaving of philosophical traditions and practices through her work supporting Indigenous Australian curriculum through an Indigenous graduate attribute and in partnership to offer professional learnings for lecturers and teachers from all disciplines. Relational cultural practices of listening and witnessing, beautiful concepts, listening and witnessing underpin her teaching and research through relationships built on trust and respect and reciprocity. Through the many stories of academics reflecting on and speaking about their research, their teaching, their pastoral care of students and community work, the notion of unsettled surfaced, alongside a growing sense of imposterism in the academy. So Jung's archetypes, for example, the carer, the hero, the trickster, the sage, were adopted 
to render authenticity to contested narratives of academic practices. Melinda maintains that the Brahma Kumari's meditative guidance and knowledge supported her to complete her thesis, a very inspiring thesis, in the Sydney lockdown in 2021, and to engage collaboratively when teaching diversity and inclusive practices. For the past five years, Melinda has enjoyed a sense of stability through daily spiritual practice. So Melinda, it's lovely to have you with us. Tell us more about your very inspiring doctoral thesis in the context of authenticity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. First of all, I'd like to pay my acknowledgement to the Gundungara and Darug elders, where I'm sitting in Lura at the moment. I'd also like to pay my respect to the elders where I've been living, which are the Darug, the Garingai, and the Darkingjung elders, and pay respect to their continuing care for country. I had an interesting experience with Gabrielle just recently where I shared my thesis, uh, a little bit about my thesis work and we were talking. And a little bit later, Gabrielle came back and said to me, Melinda, thank you so much for that. I think your thesis was all around authenticity. And I actually took a step back and went, was it? <laughs> it really surprised me. Um, but when I go back into it now, I can, I think while working authentically, there was something underpinning my work and my practice as a teacher and a researcher. So that that sense of um, spelling out the authenticity wasn't really front and centre for me. But fortunately, when Gabrielle offered that as a gift to me, I actually thought, well, actually, it's very authentic. And there's ways that I feel I was researching authentically. Uh, and also I was inviting my research participants to share their stories in a reasonably authentic and safe manner. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about, um, about the research and, um, and also what, it, what has actually informed that research. And um, there's actually a couple of things. And first of all, I'd like to just go to some of my experiences of working with our Aboriginal or First Nations elders, our colleagues and our students who are all connected to higher educational universities in Australia, and the beautiful opportunities of sharing um, what's called truth-telling and sharing the authenticity of the way that culture is rendered through story and culture is also rendered through art, dance, music, song, circle work, yarning, etc. So that sense of authenticity was, I was invited into the sense of authenticity from a First Nations perspective. And that really, in a sense, offered me quite an awareness. It almost woke me up. Um, there's nothing like an elder really feeling that they're looking right through you, right through your heart and soul and almost knowing what you might be thinking before you've even thought it. So it was a real sense of listening and witnessing and being around uh, a culture or cultural practices that for me felt deeply authentic in a way that I hadn't experienced before. So I took a lot of gratitude and impetus from those cultural mentorings and, um, and that sense of truth telling, which is also very important around listening as well. So if I could go to my first slide, Peter, please. And I'll just walk you through a little bit about the research and what emerged and then how I worked with that research. Thank you. So I've actually reframed my thinking from notions around being very unsettled and people, particularly in the workplace prior to the COVID pandemic, expressing uh, stories about being unsettled to actually think about, I actually think what they were searching for or grappling with was their own sense of authenticity. And I, um, I actually explored this through a Jungian um, schema of archetypes. And that was rendering their stories um, that, they were, that was coming through from how they were talking about their identities. Next slide, please. So for me, I feel I'm coming to authenticity and there are those three ways. And firstly, as I've just mentioned, engaging respectfully with our First Nations peoples, cultures, histories and stories. And secondly, undertaking identity research, which is actually an interesting um, area of research that in a way found me, I didn't find identity research. But as a researcher and a developing emerging researcher, we tend to research topics that we want to find out more about for our own journey, 
for our own sense of who we were or who we are. And then as a researcher, there was quite some authenticity around questioning some of the ethical practices, particularly when working with people and their stories. Next slide, please. So I invite you to think about yourself. Just take a moment and think about yourself and ideas on identity. So identity could be something different for, in different circumstances. So think about for you, just in your own mind, what is identity? Is it physical? Is it political? Is it spiritual? Is it all of those? What frameworks might you use to think about identity? For example, there is a First Nations framework around ways of knowing, being and doing. What methods do you use to think about your identity or to develop your sense of self or thinking of your developing identity? Do you shadow or follow your mentors or teachers? Do you follow ideas that come through from the family or community or in workplaces? Do you illuminate identity through your own lived experiences and how they're shaping who you think you are and how you might be expressing your identity? These are different ways to just start to come into the topic around identity. Next slide, please. So I had a, a research question and a research project where as I work with other academics in the university around professional development or what's called academic development, um, and that's a sense that you could be a great engineer, a great social worker, a great nurse, whatever the discipline, and you could be invited in to teach in higher education with a lot of what we call discipline expertise and knowledge from the field, but not so much information or background in terms of education. And um, you may also have come through a research track. And again, you might be invited into tutoring, but you might not know exactly anything much about learning and teaching. And in higher education, there is something called the research teaching nexus. And that's about how research activities and teaching activities may relate or they may not. And it's a very important framework for a lot of people in many of the universities. And it's a, through the idea of this nexus and our roles in research, our roles in teaching, for many of us, that's how our identities are shaped. So I was asking uh, with a group of health academics at one university, what are the implications of what I was calling at that stage, this supposed research teaching nexus on their academic identities? Next slide, please. And while I went in with what I thought was a very generic, fairly safe sort of a question, I had a small group of participants and some of them I interviewed over 18 months and up to five times. And I was actually very surprised that particularly for two of the female participants who were professors, very high level and very highly regarded, their initial interview revealed tensions around these research and teaching roles. So for example, here was one small part of an interview. I never feel good enough. I've been here for 20 years and love it. I've been very lucky. Opportunities just popped up and I took them, but gee, you could do a whole thesis on this alone. Why we never feel good enough, despite all we do in our teaching and research. Next slide. Another participant, something similar. I'm struggling with a research grant application on top of everything else I'm doing. And I often feel at the moment that I'm not doing a good enough job. Now there's another topic you could explore. So again, this censored interview about self-measurement, judgment and performativity at work. And for me, I then followed this line of, of um, thinking. These were the stories and there were bigger stories around these small snippets that I'm sharing with you. But I actually went a little bit deeper and explored it um, a lot further. Next slide, please. And what I realised that there was a lot of work being done globally of what was being called imposter syndrome as a public feeling in higher education. And it occurred to me that this was not even the tip of the iceberg. This was incredibly endemic. Everybody that I speak to or raise the, the I word, the imposter word or imposterism, everybody floods forward with their feelings and their um, understandings and their own experiences. So there's something about what's going on of feeling like we're not the person we think we are, 
we're feeling like an imposter. And I think for that, we question for whom, who are, we're identifying as an imposter. Perhaps for some of us, it's a choice. Perhaps it's not a choice. Or it might be a choice in a certain context and it might not be in another. So, for example, as a non-Aboriginal woman working closely with elders now across three universities in over six years, I felt very much an imposter in terms of my cultural identity and background. But over time and through some cultural practices, I don't feel that as much anymore. And thirdly, I really would like to ask how imposterism can relate to entrenched inequalities. Where is this coming from and why are so many people feeling like this? Next slide. So I wrote a book chapter that was published in that book earlier this year. And I was thinking about imposterism, how endemic it is just in my small study. And I thought of a couple of ways that we could possibly rethink or reimagine our sense of identity and our sense of self. And I think in a way it was honouring our authenticity, but without spelling it out at the time. So I was thinking about, well, what's going on here in terms of what are the systems and structures? What are the environments that we're working in or living in that might be causing for us to feel inadequate, not good enough? What's actually happening in the outside world and how are we responding and reacting to that? And secondly, I wanted to get a sense of shifting the sense of the imposterism from that individual sense of self, thinking it really, once we start thinking we're not good enough, it's very what we call deficit discourse. And then I looked back a little bit further and looked at some of the origins in psychology um, back in the 70s where I think the ideas around imposterism emerged. So I wanted to shift it from a sense of a psychological deficit of the self into more of a social um, question about the environments and the society in which we're living and working. And I wanted to marginalise it, push it to the centre and reimagine who we think we are and how we think we're expressing ourselves. Next slide, please. Another way I wanted to work with um, the sense of imposterism and authenticity in my research study was that there's a real trick and a risk with identity research in that the more I was being authentic or authentically representing the stories from my participants, the more I was risking their actual identity. And we'd gone through a very traditional consent approach where I had written consent, they would be anonymous in the study, there would be nothing about how I would talk about this study that would reveal their identity. And that was an ethical obligation for me as a researcher and an agreement with each person. So I had to find another way of rendering their stories. And first of all, I went to fiction, and, um, and but I found that really quite difficult. And I found that that was perhaps moving away too far from their authenticity in their stories. And then I thought of thinking about the Jungian archetypes and how I might be able to use those, not as stereotypes, but as actually some sort of energy or vibration or characteristic of that archetype and how that might fit a person's story. So, for example, here, the shadow was very much fit, particularly for those two participants I shared a little bit earlier. I could really think about the shadow and how they might have been perhaps retracting into the shadow of, of who they felt they were or coming into the shadows of the organisation um, or finding actually people that they might want to shadow and collaborate with. Um, the hero was an interesting one as well. The sage, the healer and the carer. So this wasn't a one-on-one -on -one fit between one person in the study being having one archetype. In actual fact, some of their stories um, one person spoke about her father as being a great mentor. So I actually rendered the story around her father as both the sage for his wisdom and the carer for his care for her and her academic journey. So for me, the archetypal schema was safe, it was playful, and it was a way of getting around those ethical issues that I was really confronted with. And I felt more authentic as a researcher in using these stories um, much more authentically but safely, but also in a little bit of a playful way as well. Next slide. 
So I guess out of all of that, um, my story of coming into identity is actually what I found out was that there's, we have multiple and shifting identities. So I think when we think of being authentic, I, I see it as something a little bit fluid and that we are adapting um, in terms of the context, the people, the environments. I also think it's about honouring deep cultural protocols and practices, particularly from our First Nations Australian um, wisdom traditions and deep spiritual philosophies, care for country, such a beautiful authenticity, um, particularly when you're on country with elders. I think we need an awareness of the societal forces and what impact that's having on our sense of self and how we perhaps can reposition ourselves or reimagine or even advocate for change. I really did enjoy playing with the archetypes and I'm doing um, uh, some more writing around that at the moment and really going a bit further and a bit deeper and perhaps through the opportunity here I can think about talking about authenticity and archetypes as a connected um, as a connected idea a little bit more and I think for me lastly it's a feeling if we feel authentic I guess we will be authentic and really honoring and respecting the feeling which I think brings us back to Morney's um, Morney's descriptions and beautiful quotes that she offered at the start of this session around feeling and being authentic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. That's that's an amazing piece of research and and very much worth the What a journey you've been on just in, in doing that research. Too, I can hardly imagine the pro making that, you know, that this process of one thing that I, when you were speaking, I said, so many of us never feel good enough. Thank you, Gabrielle. I'm not sure if it's my internet. Yeah, that's what, what came I just checked my video. In, in terms of, um, you know, uh, are you there, Melinda? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Is it? It might right. be mine. It's unstable. I'll just turn my, my video off so I can hear you. Sure. So, Melinda, I was checking in with you around, around your research and, um, and acknowledging the depth of it and the process that you must have been through personally in undertaking that kind of work and, and so ethically as well. But um, I wondered when you were just highlighting some of the key things in it, what kind of insights you got into that big question that has been with us forever, it seems. Why is it that so many never feel good enough? Thank you, Gabrielle. It's a, it's a huge question and it would be great to go further in terms of a research approach. Um, but I guess... You know, I, I guess it's a it's a research, it's a question for all of us. I think we're all on that journey of, of interrogating these deficit feelings that just emerge and they can surface sometimes really unexpectedly and be very difficult uh, to sort of cope with. Um, so I think, you know, we, we do quite some reflective work and there's a lot around voice. So we work a lot with voice. And again, I take that inspiration from a, a principle in our Indigenous curriculum approach is about centering Indigenous voices. And it's also about finding our own voices. So I think mm. by, by working with everyone's voice, we're finding our own voice as well, and particularly through reflective writing. And I think voice is, um, voice is something that we're all working with. We're reflecting on, we're finding our voice, um, we're finding where our voice might stammer and stutter in certain circumstances, or we might have a really strong vocal voice, but our written voice may, you know, there's a whole range of ways that we can really work with voice. And I think for me, the more, um, you know, this, this research as I framed at the start, clearly there was something about identity I needed to work on. And, uh, and to learn through the stories and experiences of my participants has offered me enormous gifts in terms of who I feel I am in the academy now compared to even 30 years ago or even three years. 
And I do feel, you know, a much stronger sense of my inner sense of stability and who I am as an outcome of doing this research. So, you know, mm. often research you're finding out about something else or somebody else, but in actual fact, you're always finding out something about yourself. I think that's true for every activity really, isn't it? Whether it's research or playing sport or in the workplace, really are you finding out about yourself? Um, even if your gaze is outward, uh, it uh, invariably reflects you rather than anything else or anyone else. Mm. Um, what about this whole aspect of, uh, I love what you said about reimagine our sense of self and identity. And that was really powerful to me, this whole aspect of reimagine our sen or one sense of self and identity. Um, how did you find your identities in the plural shifted over, over the span of your research? Yeah, thanks, Gabrielle. I, I guess I can answer that a couple of ways. That notion of being very unsettled, um, that really spoke to, I guess, that sense of uh, could even be identity in flux or, you know, identity as slippery soap or any of those sorts of analogies. So I think for me, it, you know, even in my own journey, a sense of being quite unsettled in terms of, you know, my authenticity and validity, my capabilities. Uh, you know, even they're very tangible, my my own writing, um, that's been a huge journey in terms of being an author and coming into a feeling of being much more settled mm. and having a lot more clarity or crystallisation around the sorts of work I do, how the work's connected and how the work actually speaks to something deeper inside of me. And that gives me more a sense of being settled. Sure. And I think, I think yeah, sorry. No, no, go on. What were you going to say? I think secondly, uh, while I drew on First Nations um, approaches and principles, I also drew on feminist uh, research principles. And that very much is that sense of care, authenticity, reciprocity, so safety. So, And for me, there was a natural affinity between our First Nations approaches and, our and some of the feminist participatory research approaches I was using. And both of those together nourished me and gave me a stronger sense of identity. So it was very much using conceptual work, but by doing it and actually having the lived experience really offered me um, a more settled sense of who I, who I was. And that, of course, helped me to actually complete quite a big piece of work in a very challenging environment. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a, a lovely... Um... A big strength, isn't it? First Nations approach and feminist approaches. Um, I think that makes for a very, a very strong piece of work. Uh, insight, full of insight, and and um, being able to see things differently. And I, I remember you saying, you know, you talked about shifting the sense of imposterism from the individual psychology, if you like, to looking at and seeing it more as a social question about. You know, more systemically, a social question about the environment and, and um, I guess, organised culture and so on. So um, those philosophies or those understandings would have offered a lot of insight into that, I'm sure. Hmm? Yeah, thank you. And that's that sense of repositioning. So looking at your positioning, your sense of self and reimagining or repositioning and that sense of movement, there's always an opportunity to be actually doing that, doing that sense of movement and adapting and adjusting over time. Mm -hmm. I think it's available to us all the time. Yeah, yeah. Morning, can we bring you in here? It'd be lovely to hear some comments from you about this conversation because there's obviously some points of great connection between what you were saying earlier and the, the findings that Melinda's um, and the process that Melinda went through, actually, but as well as the outcome, some of the outcomes. What strikes you? Yeah, well, actually, what first came to my mind, I spoke so much about not following, and I found these two aspects of shadowing and following very um, very important because, you know, sometimes when we say something, there's something left out. And uh, of course, there is a time to shadow and to follow. And we can learn so much from others. So <laughs> it was just an interesting balance, I think, to what I was saying about 
really knowing yourself and not following, not being influenced. But, you know, there's so much to learn from shadowing and following. So I just found it interesting that those two aspects came up quite strongly in the presentation and and positively, I would say, too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. How's that sitting with you, Melinda? Yes, thank you. I think for me it's a process. And, you know, perhaps sometimes there's such a, a strength by just, um, you know, being with uh, somebody who you want to emulate some of their characteristics or grow in your own sense from something of their capability or their strength. And I guess like any, they say at any time that you the teacher finds you, but then you know when your time to offer that or to move away and really stand on your own two feet, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and also the whole thing of um, this feminine aspect that you brought in, the Indigenous and the feminine. Um, yeah, I found that interesting because I also find quite a lot of masculinity in the, but I have very little experience and insight into the um, the Indigenous traditions and their wisdoms. But, yeah, I just found that also very interesting. And, yeah, if you want to say something more about that, because I was wondering if you specifically felt, you know, um, something important for you there because it can sometimes be difficult as a woman in various fields, in academia, in, you know, and that's where we often feel not good enough or, you know, so I was just wondering where that feminine came in for you. Fantastic question. Thanks, Morni. Um, it's feminist principles. So it's principles that have drawn from those traditions. And um, it's actually something I'm writing about at the moment. I'm actually writing about um, academic women, gender, if through a gender, you know, we talk about through gender. So academic women and how they've coped or what um, changed for them through the COVID pandemic in higher education. And many things changed, but there's been an incredible focus around mm -hmm. some women globally telling their stories. So it's actually mm -hmm. some follow-on research I've been doing and, and been writing about. And, you know, there's some massive stories there in terms of a duty of care at home, duty of care at work, care and coping responsibilities, and I'm not just limiting this to, to females, but the stories that are coming through are predominantly from women in higher education at the moment. So there is quite a focus on gender and the pandemic. Um, I guess the, mm. the next, the way I, I bring it all forward and, and wrap it round to where I started is that when I talk about supporting Indigenous curriculum in higher education, which is a national strategy, so it is actually happening across all universities in Australia, my final part of the research was looking at then in what ways when we're engaging with First Nations principles and practices around teaching research, history, stories and cultures, my final question was in what way is that reshaping our identities? Mm -hmm. So it was actually bringing it all the way around to think, you know, if I'm working a lot more collaboratively with our elder in residence or with so inviting a, a First Nations student in to tell us about um, cultural safety and to teach the other teachers, how is that reshaping who we are and how we're um, shifting in terms of embracing other ways of knowing, being and doing? And I think that's how I really bring it all back around in terms of authentically respecting cultural teaching and learnings and how, what, what does that mean for me going forward? Mm. Yeah, a lovely reshaping process, I should think, actually. Very enriching, isn't it? You know, the way that we allow ourselves into these spaces now, and are allowed into them too, and the impact that that has and shapes us and influences us really positively. Melinda, I'm going to invite you to do a live meditation commentary with us. Would you like to do that in, in terms of your authenticity, your authentic journey? Yes, thank you, Gabrielle. So I'd like everyone just to take a breath. Just take a moment. 
Just slow the sense of the information. And just slow the sense of the stories that have been shared today. And I'd like to invite you to think about your many voices. And today, I'd like you to realise that as I speak to you through my authenticity, you will be speaking through the events of the day, through people you may have encountered, through things, through all creation. You may have used your ears, your eyes and your heart to perceive you, however veiled your presence may or may not be. As I've offered some insight, I also invite you to give me insight, to see through the exterior, and go to the interior truth. I invite you to think about your spirit of discernment. Think about discerning throughout your day, through the events, the people, the things, and all creation. And as you discern through your day, reflect on your voice. Reflect on the realities and the truths of your existence the joy of your growth, the splendour of your action and the glory of your power. Look well, therefore, authentically today and tomorrow and explore your sense of self in a way that is safe kind, forgiving, and gentle. I'm Shanti. Thank you, Melinda. That was some um, beautiful summary of some of the key things that you've been speaking of earlier. So thank you for that meditation. Um, we have a few questions that I'm going to pitch to both Morney and Melinda. So if if you feel, um, you know, like you'd like to answer it, then please just go ahead. It's, they're, not, they're not specific to either of you. And perhaps you'd both like to offer some responses to it. The first one is, why do I struggle to be authentic? Well, if I could just start by saying that, you know, um, I think it's sometimes because we really don't know ourselves because what I've done a little research, you know, my research is not like Melinda's. It's just like asking people who come to our centres. And I found that people who come to know themselves love themselves. Sometimes we're afraid to know ourselves because we're afraid that we won't like ourselves. But from what I've, you know, kind of done in my little research is, the more people know themselves, the more they accept themselves and love themselves. And I think this knowing the self is the first step to authenticity. Thanks, morning. Melinda, do you want to pitch in there? Yeah, I, again, I would really advocate for not just looking inside at the individual, but looking in terms of the outer societal forces, the systems, cultures and structures or the influence of people around you. So getting a sense of what's happening, you know, in the outer world and, and how that is affecting ad, perhaps adversely at times in the inner world and, and sense of self. 
Mm. And, and render an archetype, you know, give yourself an archetype and actually play into that notion of what that character might be and use the strength of, of that archetype to actually, you know, just play with it and that might create some sort of, you know, engaged way of, of um, just lifting the struggle perhaps. Thank you. Another one coming through is um, it's around alignment with my inner truth and um Where's the space for others' truths and for listening in the context of authenticity or being authentic? Do you want to start? So, with yeah, it, it's around aligning with um, with my inner truth, uh, which I think that was something, Mona, you mentioned in in your at the beginning of of um, of our conversation, you know, that importance about aligning with your inner truth. And and the question here is, where's the space for others' truths and where's the space for listening? What role does that have in being authentic? Yeah. Um, first of all, I just, I don't have a graph here, but I was offered a, a little, you know, insight into aligning with our truth. It's like we have a line that we are meant to be on like naturally, and the more we're off our line, the distance between our line and where we end up is the stress in our life. So that is, I think, a key. Mm -hmm. that if we're aligned, we are not in stress. And when we're not in stress, there's such an easiness that I think it's not difficult to listen to others and allow others to be who they are, believe what they believe, because we, you know, when we're not in stress, stress is such a survivalist instinct that we're just in survival. So we come up against others. But when we're not in stress, we've got such an ease that people can more easily be who they are. Mm -hmm. Lovely. How does that resonate with you, Melinda? You, you talked about in your research, listening and witnessing. Yes, absolutely. And we're working with a practice in our teaching, particularly around we have a reflective circle. So we invite people to into reflective practices. And um, it, we focus on it being very non-judgmental. So we're listening um, in a way that is very respectful and we're witnessing the stories. And then we can engage in dialogue because often there's something there's a my story, your story uh, pra practice as well. So often there might be something in my story if I've given the, the safety and the comfort to render something about my story that may just connect with something in your story. And then through that non-judgmental listening and sharing, then we can have dialogue. And it's, it's incredible how often the synchronicities in people's stories and lives emerge. And I find that a very supportive practice as well. And across yeah. cultures, I can imagine, Melinda, you know, it doesn't matter which culture, the stories are so similar at the end of the day. Absolutely. It's a wonderful intercultural practice. It's a really mm. lovely way to engage and really honour the uniqueness of cultures So, and the uniqueness of every individual and their experiences. So, you know, it's not about really harmonising and everybody being the same through my story, your story. It is actually about using the story sharing process to really surface and honour those beautiful, distinctive qualities that we've all got. A very safe way too, isn't it? You know, it's a very safe way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a practice, a skill, a talent, a quality that, um, that needs to be honed, deep listening. It's not something that uh, is necessary, you know, my experience anyway is that it's something that, it's a practice that needs to be honed. It's... We're not taught it. We're not taught to deeply listen at all, um, especially not in a rush, rush, rush environment that we often operate in. Mm. And in the nonviolent communication, you know, Marshall Rosenberg talks a lot about empathy and he says empathy is being present. And most people who think that they, you know, are empathetic are not. <laughs> so I think it was good to put that in the front of the book because you know, often we think we are really listening. And I know for myself, you know, I've been studying and practicing this for so many years. And yet still, I, I'm not always the best listener. So. 
I think that's also being really honest. It's a process, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is a process. And, and you know, we can't have these kind of really lofty, unrealistic expectations in ourselves all the time because, you know, we're all on our journey and we're all meeting and engaging with all sorts of things every day. And um, and I think that's that sense of just, you know, being kind and be, being kind on yourself primarily and having that sense of ease morning that, that you're talking about. And, and that really is infectious. You know, if you're around somebody with that sense of ease, it's hard not to to actually try and um, emulate that or, or just receive that and, and hold that, that sense of ease. Lovely. Here's another one coming through is how can you tell if someone is not being authentic? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What happens for you? How do you assess authenticity? I think that's also why we need that intuition because mm-hmm. sometimes people, you know, like I've I've read about, you know, narcissism and things like that and, you know, because I think we need to be to know you know when about all these things and intuition helps quite a lot I think in this area Mm, yeah there's been experiences of it but let's see what Melinda has to say yeah look these are just thoughts that are coming forward Um, again there's judgment we have to be careful around judgment Um, and I think just sharing one practice that you know some of my dear lifelong school friends that we're still very 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 close friends now and we've had this saying over decades that you know if I guess if we sense somebody's not being authentic or or true true to who they are we have this saying of you know go for a a long walk down the hall of mirrors so (laughs) you know I don't know if you remember in fun parks you know when we were younger they had these hall of the hall of mirrors and you know, we'll go for a long walk down the hall of mirrors and hopefully you can you can actually do the work, reflect what's reflected there in terms of mirror. What's mm-hmm. in a mirror is being reflected back to you. So it's an invitation, I guess, to just stop and and let the mirror reflect what um what might be there for you and and for the other person not to be judgmental. Mm-hmm. And hopefully they can come out of the hall of mirrors with a bit of clarity, I guess, in a in a sort of sense of peace. That I don't know. I know whenever they've said that to me, I sort of think, oh, <laughs> whoops. Okay, yeah. better just stop, just pause and reflect and just take time. Yeah, I mean, any kind of learning happens best when it's non judgmental, isn't it? In a non judgmental environment, and it's key to being feeling safe. Yeah. Here's one that's come in here and it says, how does years of experience in Raj Yoga meditation change the way we become or feel authentic? Do you want to start, Melinda? Sure. Goodness. Again, I'll speak from my own experience. Um, I found it incredibly empowering. Uh, and I use the knowledge through the Brahma Kumaris to rewrite, rewrite the script of my self-talk, which can be very sort of def- deficit and damaging. So I've learned a, a pretty solid practice now to just really quickly change that script. Or if that's a script that's been there forever and it's really not served me very well, I know how to replace it with another script of, of something, a much more empowering form of self-talk. Um, and the other way is I can actually use an image. I, I do a lot of imagery in my my mind or a feeling of a memory. But a strong image that is is really kind, gentle, neutral, that's another way of actually using the knowledge, using the powers to change any of that sort of negative self-talk trap that I can very easily go into. Mm. And for me, I think, you know, one of the things that I benefited most from when I started the practice was learning to be more emotionally independent because I really saw that I was such a reaction to other people. And as they say, if I am me because you are you, then I'm not me and you are not you. And uh, I just found that, you know, not being influenced by other people gave me such a freedom. Like if someone was not in a good mood or something, you know, I used to think I have to, you know, improve, help them or, you know, I didn't know what to do. So 
being emotionally independent was such a great way to step back. Mm. I mean, I think um, a spiritual journey is really a journey to authenticity, isn't it? Um, and, and there's a, a bit of a connection between the authentic self and seeing the self as a soul. Uh, and um, and I, I was thinking of that, Melinda, when you're talking about multiple identities in your research and and um, the shifting space of them and, and where the grounding of being a soul, uh, having that kind of spiritual awareness, um, how that impacts or is maybe ameliorates that uh, that feeling of being an imposter. Not sure, just a thought. Yeah, great thought experiment. Uh, I think when I was doing that work around identity in the sense of multiple identities, it was very much connected with the roles that people were playing. So where they had multiple roles, of course, they tended to sort of have an identity that matched that role. And that was that sense of moving in and out of different types of what we call role-based activities. Um, to think about it at the level of the soul, I think that you wouldn't have that necessarily. The, the soul would move, I guess, through the different roles on the inner journey. So I think there'd be a solid a stability in the sense mm. of the soul and it having, uh, or the soul not being such a shifting um, multiple identity kind of entity and therefore it would be hard I would imagine to render a sense of imposterism at the level of the soul that was that would be yeah. my proposition or my provocation mm -hmm. um yeah mm. well we often talk about the soul playing different roles so um yeah but you know at the at the heart of it you're you're a soul so uh yeah I guess it, it does give that sense of stability for sure mm. Um, but something worth looking at. I think you did explore it quite deeply, actually. I remember a conversation with you quite a while back where we were looking at, at identities, beliefs, thoughts, opinions, and so on, and, and then moving into, if you remove all of that, what's there, what's left, and, and you know, you can see the soul being there. And look, here's one about leadership that's come on, which I'd like to, to put to both of you. And you're saying that, um, I've heard it said that authentic leaders um, they admit what they don't know. They're aware of all their selves. They have strong values and they live by them and they listen carefully to those they disagree with. Would you add anything to that or would you disagree? Where does that sit with you in terms of authentic leadership? Those four things, let me say them again. It's they admit what they don't know. Um, so, you know, you could quickly ask yourself, when was the last time you said at work or wherever? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, they're aware of all these selves, so those multiple identities. They have strong values and they live by them and they listen carefully to those they disagree with. Yeah. Is there any any tips on that? Is there anything that you would add to that? Moni, you've spent a lot of time looking at leadership and the future of power and authenticity. And, and of course, um, Melinda, you were engaging in that space as well. Yeah, I think that summarizes it pretty well. I'm just thinking what's not covered in that? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I think so. And um, thinking in, particularly in terms of the university, having a culture that's supportive of actually saying that I don't know or being that it's okay not to know because there's this whole knowledge industry and it's all about knowing. And we're really trying to bring that being and doing sense much more into, you know, it's not just about what's going on in a cognitive sense or in you know, in our brains, but it's actually the whole experience, and um, and it, it's actually great to not to not know because it opens up lines of inquiry and and you know people's curiosity and their search for meaning in all sorts of all sorts of circumstances. So, um, you know, we we would often start something about thinking of of actually un, unstitching what you think you might know. Actually, if we use a weaving metaphor, which I, I do. Mm -hmm. How can we unstitch what you think might be a rigid belief or a rigid piece of information or knowledge? And it might be actually really liberating to kind of lighten up, unstitch that so that you can actually then interweave, you know, other perspectives or, or wider perspectives or beliefs. And that's a, a, a part of a, journey, a learning journey of transformational, transformative learning that, that we work with. 
And I guess that you not really move into the other also has an aspect of it of being vulnerable. And the only thing I was thinking about feelings, because I find when people can name their feelings, it changes the whole dynamic of the, the onward exchanges, you know, it just puts it out there and yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, 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 naming feelings and and speaking feelings and expressing feelings, it does bring in, um, it makes it a lot more meaningful, for sure. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm going to finish with one last question, because it's a great one. Is there a role for the divine in developing authenticity? What's been your experience, both of you? Well, just to say that, you know, this method of yoga, of connecting, not praying, not asking, but connecting. And when I can really connect, I experience myself. It's not so much getting something from the divine. So that knowing is, um, is so awakening uh, that's all I can say you know I really when I know I kind of realize I awaken to who I am so the divine has a very big part to play in this whole awakening yeah I'd certainly concur with that Morni. absolutely and however that sense of divine is for um, each individual um, you know certainly that sense of connecting for you know my experiences of cultural immersions on country and connecting with elders and their connection of country and how it's expressed um it, it, it is really divine it's it's beautiful mm. Mm. Oh, that's lovely look i'm going to have to push pause on this conversation but it's one that i'm sure that we can take up around a cup of tea at some point um but uh time's of the essence now and we're needing to close but I'd like to say a huge thanks to you Morni and to you Melinda for the courage to walk a journey of authenticity and um, that's been very evident in the stories and the sharings that that you've given us tonight so thank you very much for that our blessings and our love to both of you and thanks for joining us on Universe this evening thank you very much Gabriel thank <laughs> you thank yeah, you my pleasure beautiful thank you viewers um as always, you might like to browse our online bookshop, Eternity Inc., which has a full online range of books on self-empowerment and spirituality, and always at not-for-profit prices. Um, great ideas for Christmas and New Year gifts. You'll find plenty there. And you'll also find Morney's book um, there as well. So please uh, take the opportunity to have a look through that. And if you'd like to, su to subscribe to Open Your Eyes to the Universe to receive monthly updates, please email us at special.events at au.brahmakamaris.org. And this is our last episode of Universe for 2022, and what a year it's been on all levels. And we began 2022 in January with Dr. Janara Goringoring, who shared her spiritual journey of a First Nations woman with us. And in February, we were exploring the feminine with Maureen O'Connor, Philippa Blackham, and Angelica Fangel. And then Yogini Denise Lawrence joined us on Universe in March to share her experiences and insights on understanding soul consciousness. In April, Patricia Heinz joined us in Time to Heal. And then in May, Dr. Annette Mortensen and Samantha Fraser explored belonging with us. In June, Andy Travis and, and Dolly Mahatani spoke on, on the topic Finding Your Authentic Voice. And then Alex, Alex Pato and Joseph Yachewski joined us in July, and their topic was listening. Eric Lorest joined us in August, and he was speaking on diversity and inclusion. And in September, we shared a conversation with Associate Professor Jamie Redfin and Judy Rich on movement and meditation. And then in October, Dr. Tamazin Ramsey joined us for a conversation on sustainable yogic fam fam farming. Sorry, And here we are tonight with a beautiful conversation on authenticity. So within the comfort of your home, we've transversed many continents of our world, talking with meditators who engage with life in many different ways. And our special thanks and blessings to all these authentic, inspiring people who shared their insights and experiences with us on Universe throughout 2022. And if you'd like to recap or re-listen to any of these episodes, we'll place the links in the chat box for you so you can check it out there. 
And of course, our dear viewers, thank you so much for your questions and your participation. And I hope our explorations together have been hugely beneficial to you and that they've positively impacted our planet. So from the universe team, Jan Wright, Peter Clark, Debbie Hannon and myself, we're very much looking forward to sharing 2023 with you. We'll be back on Saturday, the 21st of January at 6 p.m. AEDT. So until then, we'd like to wish you a very relaxing and peaceful Christmas and may the new year be filled with love, happiness and an abundance of spiritual treasures. We're going to close tonight with a song from Bliss called Child. It's got some very authentic words in it. I think you'll like it. So until we see you again in January, take care, walk lightly on this earth and be authentically you. Om Shanti. Do you speak?